Support School is brought to you by BASF and Pride Seeds. We're here at the Southwest Ag Conference, and I'm joined by Randy Doughty, a corn farmer from Georgia who uh, grew 504 bushel corn in 2014. Sir, welcome uh, to Canada. Thanks for having me. I uh, appreciate the Southwest Ag Conference and the sponsors that were able to get me here. Great. Hey, uh, now 504 bushels, and, uh, an amazing number. And I, I think the overall thought that you, you brought to the conversation was, hey, challenge conventional thinking, always be a student of the crop. That's correct. You know, the biggest problem with most farmers is they've been doing things for a long time. It's hard to argue with farmers that have been successful and have paid for farms and have paid and done different things along the way, pay for you know, college educations and you know, pay for ground, et cetera. And if they've done things right for a long time, it's hard to argue with that when they've been successful. But what if they could have made 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 bushels more? How quickly, how much more quickly could they have you know, reached their retirement goals or you know, had other dreams that they were able to, to realize. The biggest problem is, is that the definition of insanity says that, you know, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So the, uh, farmers are creatures of habit. They have tunnel vision. Industry seems to have tunnel vision. Universities seem to have tunnel vision. They keep teaching us how to make the same yields we've been making for years. Now we need to look at ways to make higher yields. Think outside the box. The only way we're going to feed this planet in 2050 you know, with nine billion people with less land to farm is to make higher yields. We can't rely on the seed companies just to give us higher yield potential. We have to realize what the limiting factors are on our farm. Quite often the limiting factors are things that are in our control. Everybody looks at weather and by all means weather can be a limiting factor but you have to look at different things that are in our control. We've got harvest loss that takes overall yield from us. We have compaction that takes yield away from us. We have to remediate or alleviate that yield limiting barrier which is compaction quite often we can do that mechanically with a, a deep tillage rig or we can make sure we have controlled traffic patterns or patterns across the field so we have to make sure that you know we control the variables that are in our control another yield limiting factors you know herbicides spraying herbicides at the wrong time that can cost us yields we've got quite a bit of data that supports you spray herbicides at the wrong time you know it costs you 30 40 50 bushels an acre the higher the yield potential the greater the penalty when you spray them at the wrong time there are a lot of data out there that suggest that. Quite often farmers spray at a certain time because that's the way they've always done it or that's when they can get to it. They have to understand the penalty and the risk that there's, that's associated with doing things the wrong time. I want to talk specifically about a couple of things you talked about. Um, disease prevention and spraying fungicides. You, you, you have you spray twice, V10, V12, and R1 and R2. Talk about your, your, your fungicide. Program. Well, we do. We address nine times out of ten on every acre we'll have fungicides in furrow. And most years, if we're cool and wet, we get a huge response. And it's easy to see because now we're, we've got more pressure on that seedling. But, you know, we'll address fungicides in furrow. And then, you know, from that point, we then address fungicides or disease through a fungicide at V10 to V12. I mean, that is when the ear leaf is either at a collar or it's either, you know, in the whirl and we can get coverage on that ear leaf. And that's a big deal. So we'll spray at V10 to V12 with fungicides and then we'll do a post tassel application. And we'll do, you know, that could be at R1, it could be at R3, it could be at R4, R5, R6. Whatever the disease pressure is, we make sure that that's not our yield limiting factor. Right. What about, uh, let's <coughs> talk a little bit about nutrients. Obviously, you know, at 500 bushels, mm -hmm. you talk about you gotta feed it. You know, we gotta throw the conventional, hey, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to grow a 200 acre crop, sorry, 200 bushel crop, not a 300 bushel crop, I need to feed this for 500. That's right. Whatever your yield potential is, it's set at the time of, that the plant emerges and when it comes up. So we don't want to cap that with inconsistent emergence, but we also don't want to cap it from not having enough nutrients. And that's a big deal. You know, if you're going to grow 300 bushel corn, you got to make sure it's got 300 bushel fertilizer available to the plant. It matters what's in the soil, but more importantly, it matters what's in the plant. The only way you're going to know that is doing pulling tissue samples and build that database. Understand what the levels are throughout the year, what levels have to be maintained. Then, if you want to make higher yields, obviously it takes more bushels, or more fertilizer to achieve those bushels. So, with that being the case, we hear all the time how much nutrients it takes to make a bushel of corn as it pertains to nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash. But we never hear anything about how many elements of each one of the micronutrients is needed to make a bushel of corn. 
that's where the research needs to be refocused. We need to know how much manganese does it take to make 300 bushel corn. And do we have enough in the soil and do we have enough in the plant? Boron, same thing. Calcium, magnesium, zinc, iron, all of the micronutrients are equally as important in the outcome of yield as well as the N, P, and K. Everybody focuses on the N, P, and K. But if you believe in the law of the minimum, and you go back to that barrel, and you believe that yield is proportional to the most limiting nutrient available, then it doesn't matter how much nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash you got if boron's the limiting factor. So you have to look at the law of the minimum and understand it. Now, you wrapped up your presentation today, and you used the term, you used the silver bullet. Now, a lot of people are afraid to use that, but you really believe in inconsistent plant emergence is really a something that farmers should and need to control. Well, if you want to make 300 bushel corn, it starts with a 300 bushel stand. So if people are always looking for a silver bullet as a way to increase their yields. The way to increase their yields by far, the first box that has to be checked is that all the plants come up at the same time. Most people plant 32, 34, 36,000 or greater populations or less populations and they assess their stand based on I planted X amount of seed and I got an X amount of percentage of them up. So if you planted 30,000 plants, you got 29,000 of them up, you say, well, I did a good job. Well. That means that you were within the germ specs of the, what was set on the seed. That's important, but what's important is that all the plants emerge at the same time. And just because you get them up doesn't necessarily mean they're going to contribute. Because here's a visual way for you to know if they come up at the same time. Think about your fields. Think about walking in your fields this year or years past or this coming year. And understand that if you've got different ears at different internodes and different heights on the plant, that those plants didn't come up at the same time. So therefore, when you start looking at the yield difference between an ear that's on the high, one node and the yield on the, the ear that's at a node lower, there will be a response negatively nine times out of ten when they don't come up at the same time. Now you did some research on and that's correct. cost you. That's correct. Well, I mean, this year we did 20 different plots. We had 20 different hybrids. We looked at, we did what we called a flag test. I come up with a flag test so you could come up with a way to assess what kind of stand and what kind of yield potential you may be able to make, have on the farm. Every farmer can do. Right? Absolutely. They can do this on their farm. They take one one thousandths of an acre. If you're on 30 inch rows, we'll use that for an example. You take one one thousandths of an acre, that's 17 and a half feet. 17 and a half feet. You go out there at 80 to 100 GDUs or you walk next to the adjacent row from where you're going to do this test and you start scratching seed and you make sure that you're there the day that the seed starts to sprout. When, not sprout, starts to emerge. When that spike is coming out of the ground for the very first time. When that little needle is that quarter inch or less and it's coming up out of the ground and it's seeing daylight for the very first time. You've got to be there. You take a red flag and you put it beside every plant that's up when they all first start poking their head out of the ground, 12 hours later, you notate how many GDUs and you notate this is the red flag, this is how many GDUs it has when it came up, this is the first emergers. You come back 12 hours later, you now have a blue flag. You take the blue flag, you put it beside every plant that now does not have a flag beside it, and you notate on a piece of paper, these are the plants that came up 12 hours later, this is how many GDUs. You do that so on and so on, red, blues, whites, greens, until every plant is marked within that one one thousandth of an acre. Once every plant has been marked, you keep that piece of paper and you just put it in the visor or some safe, safe keep in place, and you come back at harvest. You come back at harvest. If you have five different flag colors, then you bring five buckets with you. And you take all the red flags and put them in a bucket, and the blues and the whites and the yellow accordingly. And then you take them to the pickup truck. And then you look on the back of your pickup truck and you start shucking back the ears and you look at it and you say, wow. Because that will be your aha moment. When you start having less kernels that more importantly weigh less, and the only factor that was different was emergence. It got the same sunlight, it got the same rainfall, it got all the same management practices. The only thing that was different was how they come up out of the ground. And when you see that there's a 20, 30, 40, 50% difference as eat from in, in difference in yield as 12 hours go by or 36 hours go by or whatever that factor is and you start figuring out where your yield is lost then you'll figure out what the planter cost you when it left the field and quite often you know those variables are 100 percent related back to poor you know planting practices you're planting too fast poor seed bed preparation not planting consistent seed depth not making sure that you got good seed to soil contact good moisture or you got a two inch rain and it crusted the ground crusted, it got hard, and the seed couldn't push up uniform. 
One thing we can do, we can pray the Lord sends us rain if we don't have irrigation, or we can turn a pivot on and soften that ground and let it emerge uniformly. No. That's what we do. During your presentation, you said that you had a few tips beyond that that you didn't get a chance to mention in your presentation, whether it be seed treatments or... One of the things we use quite often is a seed treatment. I don't know if it's licensed to come to Canada, but we use a product called Invigorate. Um, it's a micro-encapsulated phosphate that's a, applied as a seed treatment, similar to the process that you would do when you treat soybean seed. You just treat the corn seed the same way. We're seeing 7 to 15 bushel response from that. Um, that's been on repeated for four years, and it costs about two bushels, so that's good ROI. Other tips, we could go for hours, so we don't have the time. So. <laughs> Hey Randy, we'll, uh, I hear you're going to be uh, down in the U.S. at the, the Farm Farm Machinery Show down there, and I'm going to be down there, so maybe we'll hook up then, maybe we'll continue this down there. Okay, Great sounds sir. good. Hey, thanks for your time today. Great tips. Appreciate it. Thank you.